Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxo, and this is Superhouse. Today I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the architecture of the system that I'm putting together, both from an electrical perspective and also from a software perspective. I get a lot of people asking me what software I'm using to run the home automation system, so this will give a little bit of an explanation of that. But before I get into that, you need to understand a little bit about the architecture at an electrical level. Now, first thing we'll do is talk about how a normal house uh, electrical system works for the simplest case, which is turning on and off lights. So imagine in your house you have lights in a couple of rooms and those rooms have switches in them. So you've got a light switch on the, um, the wall of each room. What happens is that your switchboard has a number of circuits in it. And there are circuit breakers and they're all fed from uh, one of the incoming lines. So what happens is that say your lighting circuit which has a single circuit breaker um, or there might be a couple will be wired to the hot side of the light switches. So the light switches themselves then are connected through within each room to the light. Now this seems like a pretty obvious circuit. You turn on the light switch and the power can go through and the light turns on. Easy. And it also means that what happens is that the, uh, the, permanent, the supply side, the permanently on side of the circuit, can just loop around from room to room so at your switchboard you might only have say two or three lighting circuits and they will have a cable that comes out of the switchboard and it goes to multiple rooms around the house and it just hops around. So you don't use all that much cable because it's really just one bit of cable going around each of the rooms. What that doesn't give you is any centralized control. So the approach that I'm taking is a little bit different. And so instead of having all of these um, lights wired through local switches, what I've done is taken the opportunity of the renovations to remove all of the existing wiring and instead every light is wired all the way back to the switchboard. So uh, in this room for example we've got lights up on the ceiling the cable from that does not go to a switch on the wall it goes all the way to the switchboard and is wired into its own circuit essentially so we've got a whole bunch of circuits one for every single light in the house. What that means is that instead of having just a couple of cables coming out of the switchboard, we've got a big fat bundle of cables because it's got to have a cable for every single load that you're going to control. The advantage that gives is that it means that everything is centralized and can be controlled from one point. Now, what do we do about the light switches? What that means is that the light switches themselves no longer need to switch mains voltage. So the old light switches go away they are just totally irrelevant, taken off the wall, um, cables all ripped out, there's nothing left there at all. And in this diagram what I'm doing is using red to represent high voltage and I'll use blue to represent low voltage and ethernet connections. So instead what we do in each room is we have a control panel that might have a couple of buttons on it um, or we might have an Android um, tablet or something like that. Now you can see an example here, so this is an Android tablet which is serving up a web interface. We'll get onto that later. That's probably in another episode. That's a different, um, a different method. But what we have are light switches. The very first one that I put together that uses this technique is this one. I've since retired it, so I can just wave it around and use it as a demonstration. So it has illuminated buttons. It's not powered up right now, so there's no illumination. You can just press the button and um, it sends a signal. Now this is the interesting bit. It's not switching mains. What's behind it is a bit of Vero board with the buttons wired into it. There is an Arduino compatible board here and there is an Ethernet shield um, which has power over Ethernet support wired into it. So what happens is that this sits inside the wall. This is the unit here replacing the light switch and when you press one of these buttons it communicates via Ethernet, so that's a network connection, back to a central point. Now the, um, the reason that one's retired is that I had to do lots of them, so I made up custom PCBs, so the more modern ones look a bit like this. So it's a PCB that's set up so you can have it with either two, four or six buttons, and they work in pairs, so I normally have it wired up so that it's on and off buttons. Um, you can have three pairs on there, so control three devices. 
And so what happens is that each of these is wired via Ethernet back to an Ethernet switch. And they're running power over Ethernet, so we don't need to run power to each of these directly, they just get it over the network cable. So the end result is that what we have is centralized links for all of the lights coming back to a switchboard. And we also have centralized links for all of the control surfaces, so the light switches, the buttons, coming back to an Ethernet switch. Now the interesting bit is what happens between those. So we've got high voltage and low voltage, totally isolated. Um, this is logic, it's just messages passing around, it's not actually switching anything directly. This is where all of the loads are controlled, where all the high voltage stuff happens. Okay, so now you know the basic architecture. The next interesting thing is the software that is used to run on these in order to control this. So, to understand that, we need to understand how the switchboard works because it's no longer just a simple switchboard with um, circuit breakers. So I'll get rid of all of this for now. And the way this is running at the moment, now this is going through a multi-stage development, so this is not really ideally how I want it to end up. The way I have it running at the moment is, imagine over this side, we have a couple of these little control buttons. In the middle here, I have a Linux box. Now in my case, that is a triple E box. I think it's a B201 model, something like that. It's a little low power Linux machine running Ubuntu. On that, I have running Apache and it's got PHP with curl support running on it. And the light switches themselves, when you press one of the buttons, send a message as a post. So it's just an HTTP post. It's sending form variables, basically. It's like you've taken your web browser and loaded up or submitted some values into a web form. So pressing one of the buttons on the light switches is the same as if you'd filled in a form and clicked submit. The variables that are sent through are the identifier for the panel itself, so you know which um, particular thing on the wall it was and the identity of the button on the panel. So we know, for example, that it's panel 22 and it was button B. Um, and there's some logic running in here which accepts those values and then does something with it. Now the other part of this is the switchboard. So inside the switchboard itself, and I'll give you a tour of that a little bit later on, we have a number of DIN rail mounted relays. So these are switching the high voltage side. We also have a little Arduino compatible board, which is an Ether 10. Um, so it's got built, on, built in Ethernet and power over Ethernet support. And that has um, outputs that are controlling the relays. So what this means is that at the moment we have a, an interface. Essentially, there is a web interface on my switchboard. So once again, I can do HTTP post and I can send a message like, I want you to turn on output channel three and the Ether 10 then turns on the appropriate relay and that particular light turns on and everything's fine. So this is the way it's working at the moment. You press one of these buttons, there's an HTTP post that goes to Apache which processes it using PHP. Um, it then uses curl to um, do another post appropriately for whatever the output is. So there's a little lookup table in here essentially. It says if this button is pressed then that's the output channel we need. And it then communicates with the switchboard which then turns the appropriate channel on or off. Now because all of the loads in the house are wired back to a central location, you can use a lot of cable. So the way we minimize that is there are actually multiple switchboards in the house. There is a primary switchboard near the front door, but it doesn't do very much. It really just distributes power. There are two automation switchboards within the house, which are quite big. They're much bigger than a normal domestic switchboard. They're industrial size switchboards. Um, because of the number of channels that have to be controlled within them. And uh, so what happens is that we have one at the west end of the house, one at the east end of the house, and then there's a demarcation line. So all of the rooms on one end of the house are wired to one switchboard, all of them on the other end wired to the other switchboard. So um, there's a bit of decentralization there. Now the thing is that HTTP is kind of heavyweight. And so with the assistance of Andy Jelmy, oh yeah, and the other thing I should point out is, um, so we've got hardware buttons on the walls. We also have 
little um, touchscreen control. So I have some of these Android tablets mounted on walls around the place, um, by 7 inch and 10 inch tablets. And this really is a web interface. It's being served up. Um, the tablets themselves load a web page served up by Apache on the Linux box. So the actual interface itself is totally generated centrally. And then when you press one of the buttons, they use a bit of Ajax um, so that it does an asynchronous update. It doesn't reload the whole page. Um, makes the button fade out nicely and fade back so you get some feedback. You know that you've pressed it properly. And it does, um, it sends an HTTP post back once again. So it's the same mechanism essentially as the, um, the buttons, except that the UI is served up dynamically. Now what we want to do, and what Andy and I have been working on just recently, is using MQTT. So that's um, MQ telemetry transport. And so we have some MQTT servers running. I have um, two running here. Andy has a couple running at his place. And we've been working on federation mechanisms and things like that. So the plan is to migrate from the black part of this over to, which is all HTTP post based, to using MQTT. Now, MQTT is a publish subscribe system. What you do is define channels and then publish information to channels and you can subscribe to channels and pull that data back. So, for example, you might define a channel as um, this is where I'm going to publish data for a temperature sensor. And then the temperature sensor periodically publishes to that channel. You might have devices that are subscribed to that channel. Whenever there's an update, they get the data. And it's a very lightweight protocol, so it's ideal for this sort of thing. It's really designed for machine-to-machine -machine communication. So it's not taking HTTP, which is really designed for a more heavyweight application, and using it uh, for a lightweight application. It's something that's designed to be low latency and um, very lightweight. So it's ideal for this sort of application. And also, there are MQTT libraries for a whole bunch of things, including Arduino. So Arduinos can do publish and subscribe. Um, there are libraries for PHP and Lua and all sorts of things. So the thing is, how do I move over from this architecture, which is my existing architecture, to using MQTT without breaking the entire house and having to do a big bang, roll it out across every light switch, every device, that sort of thing. Because the thing is, we're living in the house now. We can't afford to just take the whole house offline for a month while I do this. Um, if I have the light switches broken for very long, I get in big trouble. So, we have a plan, and this is how we're working on doing it. We've already run up MQTT servers. We have a number of devices that are publishing and subscribing already, but they're non-critical. They're just things like temperature sensors and stuff that we're using for testing. So, the plan is to start by migrating the switchboard over to using MQTT. Uh, because it's a, it's a single device, I can do one switchboard at a time, and I can do it as a drop-in replacement, so there's going to be five minutes downtime basically, the house will be offline, or the light switches will be down for five minutes, and then we can get everything running again. The way to do that is to replace the Ether 10 that's currently running in there, well, just the firmware in it. Um, instead of providing a web interface that we can post data to, what we're going to do is have this subscribe to specific channels within M this MQTT server. So one of the channels might be the, um, the desired status for the lights in my workshop. And by watching the status of that channel, it will know whether it needs to turn on or turn off or whatever, um, or messages that are published to that channel rather. So what we can then do is very simply change the, um, the PHP in here so that instead of sending out using curl to send out HTTP requests, it simply publishes to that particular channel. And we've already tested this, so I now have um, my centralized Apache system publishing to an MQTT server. And also I should point out, every time I say the word centralized, Andy uh, you know, threatens to hit me over the head with a hammer. So <laughs> the whole point of this is to try to get away from the single point of failure centralized system. We want a what he calls a unified system. Um, where we have federations of multiple machines and services that can migrate from one machine to another and do auto failover and all of that sort of thing. Right now my Linux box is a single point of failure. Part of the point of this exercise is to remove that so that the whole system is much more robust. So 
um, the Apache process can publish, or the PHP thing can publish to MQTT, which then turns on or off these outputs. So I've got this working, and the thing is that um, from the point of view of all of the devices that are sending messages, nothing has changed. They still have the same API still exists at this point. It's just that once you press a button here, it does an HTTP post, which is processed by PHP. Instead of doing a post to the switchboard, it does an MQTT publish to this, the MQTT server. The switchboard sees the change, and then it turns the appropriate output channel on or off. So that means that I can migrate partially. I can migrate on the output side to MQTT without having to cause too much problem. What we can then do is, over time, replace the, uh, the actual control surfaces themselves. This can be done one at a time with um, new firmware so that instead of doing the post, they simply do a publish to an appropriate um, topic within the MQTT server. Over time, all of this then simply becomes redundant and it can go away and we don't need it anymore. All we have is MQTT and we can do that with multiple servers that can uh, be federated and can float around on different bits of hardware and things like that. This can run on very lightweight hardware. Now part of the point of this is to try to go for something that is really simple and robust and reliable and doesn't need racks full of machines just to turn your lights on or off because that's ridiculous. This really should be quite simple. Now what this also means, something to keep in mind here, we're not just taking or defining a topic like lights in the office, having a switchboard subscribe to it and have the buttons published to that and directly turn it on or off. Now you can do that, but it limits you a little bit because you don't have the level of abstraction between your inputs and outputs. And so what we want to do is apply some logic in here. So in this diagram, what I've got is the buttons publishing to one topic and I've got the switchboard subscribed to a different topic. And the question is, how do you get an event that occurs on one topic through to another? And the way we do that is with a logic layer that sits in here. Now this could be written in Lua or C or PHP or Python or whatever, it really doesn't matter. What the logic layer does is subscribes to topics that you care about as inputs and publishes to topics that you care about as outputs. And this is where you define your whole you know, if-then logic. So if someone presses this button, we want that output channel to turn on. So it sees this, there's a button pressed that has been published to this channel or this topic. So therefore, I'm going to publish to this topic and say, I need that turned on. And this gives us a lot of flexibility. By applying logic at this level, it means that we can totally decouple the physical interaction with whatever the control surface is with the output. And we can do things like apply access controls, like uh, lock lights out at certain times or whatever. There are all sorts of things you can do there. And uh, the point of this is um, automation. And if all we wanted to do was have a light switch that turned on a light when you flick the switch, there'd be no point doing any of this. You might as well just wire the switch to the light and be done with it and everything is fine. Um, what you're going to see over some of the future videos are some of the more unusual things you can do out of this. And the benefits of the flexibility of having the abstraction and the software control that links the um, the control event to the output event. So I think one of the next things I need to do is show you inside my switchboard. So that, I think that's got to be my next video. See ya.